Have you ever felt overwhelmed by the process of preparing for the GRE and applying to graduate school? Well, if you have, you're not alone. Now, don't get me wrong, I know you're still really excited about your future. You can see that better life for yourself, and going to graduate school is a big part of that. But, you know, if, if sitting down on that first day of classes and cracking open that first book represents step E in the process, you still have steps A, B, C, and D to get there, and the GRE is a huge one of those steps, and it can all really feel a little bit intimidating. In fact, the way you may be feeling kind of reminds me of an old I Love Luke, Lucy episode. You may have seen it. Lucy and Ethel, they get a part-time job working at a chocolate factory, and they are tasked with individually wrapping chocolates by hand, and it's all going well in the beginning, everything's okay, but eventually, you know, the chocolate starts coming faster and faster, and they're going to get in trouble, they're going to get fired if they, if they miss any chocolates, and so the chocolate's coming too fast, and they can't keep up, and so they start shoving it in their mouths, and their shirts, and their hats, and anywhere just to keep uh, from getting too far behind, but they end up getting completely overwhelmed. Now, it's all pretty funny when you're watching it on TV, but it doesn't seem quite as funny if you're feeling that way in real life, and especially if you're feeling that way with regard to the GRE. Now, the good news is that's why I'm here. That's the purpose of this video, to set things straight for you, to help you kind of put things in order, to slow things down for you, so that you don't feel so overwhelmed or intimidated by this process. Hi, my name is Brett Etheridge, founder of Dominate the GRE, and for over a decade now, I've helped thousands of students just like you dramatically increase their GRE scores and get into the graduate programs of their choice all over the world. Now, a lot of you watching this video, you've been tracking with us in this GRE Mastery series. Welcome back. Others of you, you're kind of dropping in, and this is the first video you're watching. That's awesome. This video will stand alone. We're going to get incredibly practical, very tangible. You see, we're going to be talking about time management a little bit in this video, a crucial component of dominating the GRE, so you're definitely in the right place. I do encourage you to go back, though. Click on the links above, uh, check my YouTube channel, watch those first two videos so that you don't miss out because there's some really good stuff in there for you. But I'm excited about what we're going to be covering here. We're actually going to go a slightly different direction than I hinted at at the end of the last video. And the reason for that is because I've been receiving so much feedback from you guys, positive feedback, questions though, and comments about what you want to see more of. You've been responding uh, social media and in emails to the first two videos. And I want to make sure I answer those questions. You know, we're, we're coming to the end of this series and I want to make sure I'm giving you exactly what you want, exactly what you need. We are going to talk about time management as promised, but we're also going to kind of go to a grab bag of your questions. I call this video goulash, right? GRE goulash. And the reason is if you've ever had goulash, right? Goulash is it's one of my favorite meals, and it's really just a hodgepodge of ingredients uh, that's still always called goulash, right? There's always some potatoes and some rice and some uh, meat of some sort and some tomatoes, and uh, but everybody has a slightly different flair on it. I remember. <laughs> the first time I was invited to a friend's house uh, where they were serving goulash and I was all excited because I loved goulash and I sat down and, and I looked at it and I was like, no, oh, this doesn't look like goulash because it was different than my mom's recipe and I was like, ooh, yuck, you know, but when I ate it, it was still just goulash. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing, kind of the hodgepodge of ingredients here. We're going to be pulling from that mailbag. Let me give you a sneak peek at what we're going to be covering because this is going to be a slightly longer video and you may want to skip ahead if there are questions that particularly interest you. And definitely stick around to the end though because I'm going to get, give you a sneak peek of, of what's coming. Um, but first and foremost, we, we are going to be looking at time management and I'm specifically going to address uh, those of you who English may not be your first language and so you, maybe you struggle with finishing on time. But we are going to talk about some time management strategies that are going to apply for everybody. So that's really cool. Uh, the second question is going to be about what happens if your, your real GRE isn't kind of matching up with your practice test. I know that happens for a lot of students. They practice and they think they're ready and they show up on test day and they don't perform quite as well. What can you do about that? And if you haven't taken the GRE yet, how do you make sure that that's not your story? So that's going to be question number two. Question number three is going to be about verbal. Some of you have said, you know, uh, we just haven't, we, these videos have been great, but it's been mostly about quant. Give me some verbal stuff. And so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a really cool verbal strategy. Same thing with the essays. So question number four, I'm going to touch on the essays briefly. I'm going to give you kind of a, a major mindset that you want to carry into the essays uh, portion of the GRE. And and then we're going to wrap it up. Question number five is going to be about 
where should you focus your time and attention if you have a limited amount of time to study for the GRE? I know a lot of you don't have a ton of time. You're doing the GRE part-time. So where do you get the biggest bang for your buck? Where should you focus your efforts? So those are the five questions. Definitely watch it straight through if all of that interests you. For now, we're going to dive in with our very first question. This question from our mailbag comes from Cecilia Lugo in Peru. She writes, I'm feeling more confident already thanks to your videos. Truthfully, I was almost about to give up on the GRE, but now I'm thinking there's hope for me too. I'm glad you're feeling that way, Cecilia. But she continues, but English is my second language and I'm worried about finishing on time. Please help me with that. It's a great question, Cecilia. Thank you for that. And it's a question that not just non-native English speakers are concerned with. I think everybody is concerned with time management, finishing on time, making sure that you're navigating sections in the most effective way, making sure uh, that you're solving questions the most efficient way possible. So we're going to have a general conversation around that. But first, I do specifically want to address your concern as a non-native English speaker and kind of give you two thoughts, two strategies that may help you. And the first one's actually for everybody as well. And it has to do with how to progress through a section in general, right? The mistake a lot of students make is that they get bogged down too early in a section, right? So let's say this is kind of your, your scratch paper or this is just the, the questions on the screen. And here's question number one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, all the way down to question number 20. Right? This mistake a lot of students make is that they'll kind of be working through and then maybe question number three is hard. And so they spend a lot of extra time on question number three. Or maybe it's a verbal section and they get to a reading comprehension passage and it just really bogs them down and they, they are spending way too much time so that they run out of time later in the section. Don't do that, right? You have the ability of skipping questions, at least at the time of the recording of this video. And so you want to do what I call picking the low-hanging fruit, right? What that means is uh, you're getting the easy-to-access stuff. You're, you're getting the stuff that doesn't take too much time or effort. And when it comes to the GRE, what you want to do on the first pass-through of a section is work on the questions that you know you have a pretty reasonable shot of answering. So you get to question number one. You can do that. You get that one right. Question number two, hey, I got that in the bag all day long. Question number three, uh-oh, it's one of those more challenging questions or just a question that you're not quite sure about. It's not in your wheelhouse. So rather than spending five, six, seven minutes on it and you still might not even get it right, skip it. And then maybe question number four is another low-hanging fruit. You can do that one. Maybe question number five you work on for a little while. You're not 100% sure. Maybe you're missing something, but you still select an answer. You can mark it and you can come back to marked questions and so forth. And then, hey, look at that. You have plenty of time by the end of the section. Question number 20 is low-hanging fruit. You can get question number 20, and now you feel really good about yourself, right? Because what's happened? Let's say it's a 35-minute section, a quantitative section, and it's only taken you 25 minutes to move through it, picking that low-hanging fruit. And let's say you did 14 of the 20 questions in those 25 minutes. And by the way, you feel really pretty good about those 14 questions because the reason you worked on them, because the reason you spent time on them is you had a reasonable success uh, chance of succeeding on them. And the only ones you skipped or marked to come back to are the kind of the six that were a little bit more troublesome. So here you are, you're 20, only 25 minutes in, you've quote unquote completed the section. Worst case scenario, you don't get any more progress and you've still gotten 14 out of 20. Best case scenario, you now have 10 minutes left to continue working on and revisiting those other six. So now go back to those marked questions first, ones that maybe you actually did answer or you at least made some progress on, check your scratch paper and see, okay, yeah, I still think I did that right or no, I think, I think maybe I need to go a different direction, that's fine. And then go back to the ones that were maybe a little bit more challenging. And here's the thing, you, gotta, you have time in the bank at this point. You can spend as much time as you need to see if you can't figure it out. And then really as time's running out, start to make strategic guesses because it doesn't hurt your score to guess and get it wrong. So you might as well guess. There's absolutely no reason not to. Employ some of the guessing strategies I teach in my course. Uh, use strategic elimination. Throw out eyeball wrong answers, right? You want to improve your guessing odds if you're going to guess. But that's really the most effective way to move through it. So I think that will help you if time is of the essence, which it is, especially on the verbal section for non-native English speakers. But actually, the second tip I want to talk about 
um, is beef up your vocabulary and beef up your reading speed, right? But not just on the verbal section. Because I think the other reason people struggle with finishing on time is because they take too much time trying to understand what it is they're even reading, what the question is even asking. Now, the obvious place that that happens is on reading comprehension for non-native English speakers. I have great strategies in my courses and a la carte lessons on how to read passages effectively, how to skim and outline so that you don't have to read every single word. Increase your reading between now and test day. Really, there's no substitute for reading more. Head over to my blog. You see here where you can kind of check out my blog and kind of type in reading list, right? I have a reading list that you can use as a guide to pick some things that you can read between now and test day. But definitely increase your reading as you learn and increase your vocabulary. That will help as well as you're studying vocabulary for the GRE. But don't neglect the quantitative side of things. Students sometimes struggle with finishing on time on the quant side simply because it takes them a while to understand what a question is even asking. And that can come back to vocabulary in some cases, right? Like what if a question says, you know, Tom earns D dollars but deducts T percent of those dollars for tax purposes, blah, 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 right? Well, what does deduct even mean? What does it mean to deduct a certain percent? So, what and what about words like profit and revenue and questions like that. So you want to actually spend some time on vocabulary around quantitative as well so that you can actually understand what the question is asking. So I think that will help you. Now let's kind of step back from that and let's address the larger issue of time management. And just to set the stage, remember on the verbal section, you have 30 minutes to complete 20 questions. So that works out to a minute 30 per question, right? On the quant side, you have a little bit more time, 35 minutes to do the same 20 questions, and so that's a minute 45. So in general, right, this is your target, and we're not always able to do that. So how do we get to a position where we can answer each question in less than a minute 45 or a minute 30? And it goes back to these four core ideas, but let me reset the stage and remind us of what we've talked about. We talked about in video number one, that success triad, right? The three components of GRE mastery. And the time management strategies track with this to a certain extent. And here's what I mean by that. The first thing that we need to do if we are going to dominate the GRE is we do need to learn a certain amount of content, remember? And we talked about that in video number one, where we looked at actually how to solve motion problems. And I taught you some of that underlying content. And that's really time management strategy number one is you actually, interestingly, and perhaps a little bit paradoxically, need to spend time early on in your preparation just learning all of the content that is tested on the GRE. You need to spend a lot of time beefing up your vocabulary. Let's say you have a quadratic equation question. You need to flat out learn quadratic equations, right? And I don't care how long it takes you to get that into your brain. If I assign you a homework problem in my course, for example, or you're studying on your own and you come to a quadratic equation question and you sit there and it takes you 15 minutes to learn how to do it, that is okay. Because once that happens, right, new pathways are created in your brain, synapses fire, and now you actually know it so that in the future you can solve it more quickly, right? In the beginning, you don't need to worry about doing questions in a minute 45. You need to spend those 15 minutes if that's what it takes. Maybe you need to re revisit a book, rewatch some of my video lessons, go, go wherever you need to to learn how to actually do it first, for all of the content areas, geometry and algebra and word problems and probability and then on the verbal side the, of all of the vocabulary and how to read passages and analyze arguments and all of that type of stuff. So in the beginning actually don't worry about how long it's taking but then step two is okay now we do need to learn how to do it a little bit faster and the best way of doing that is to focus on strategy and if you'll remember strategy was that second key component of our success triad. And in fact, that's what we focused on in video number two. And we even looked at that in video number one, right? I taught you how to actually do motion problems. 
So maybe it took you 15 minutes to try, oh, here, I got to draw the figure and what a distance equals rate times time. And I've got the round trip question and oh my gosh, and you're like overwhelmed, and, but you're learning and that's good. Ah, but then what did we do? I taught you some strategies on how to get the exact same answer much faster. So you have non-traditional math strategies, you have shortcuts, you know, when it comes to weighted averages, I teach the seesaw method as a faster way of, of solving weighted averages, faster ways of solving probability questions, right? You need the shortcuts and the tricks and, and the ways of saying, okay, I know kind of what to do, but now I know how to do it faster. You can think about like the learning as the what, so that's kind of like what you need to know. Strategies like how, how do I now do it faster? Does that make sense? And the third component then is a kind of an extension of this and it's called pattern recognition. So the third thing that you want to focus on when it comes to time management is pattern recognition. The GRE is largely a test of pattern recognition. A question pops up on your computer screen, how quickly can you immediately identify the type of question it is and the best strategy, the best methodology, the best way of attacking it? In the world of quantitative comparisons, for example, you know, in my courses, I break down the major categories of uh, quantitative comparison questions. So it pops up on your screen and it's like, oh, this is one of those. I know what to do. Oh, this is one of those. I know what to do. That's what we looked at in the last video. You see a question pop up where you have answer choices that are all numbers. Boom. I know I can work backwards. You see variables. Boom. I know how to do this question because I know the strategies for dealing with variables. And pattern recognition becomes huge. You know, one of the things that uh, I think may help you, this is the official guide to the GRE. Whatever book you have, this is a great book. It's the reason I use it in my course. But whatever book you have, um, do something that I call GRE roulette. And what I mean by that is literally go, go to the part of the book where it just has lots of practice problems at the back of this book or some full length practice tests and just kind of flip through, like close your eyes and boom, like point to a question. That didn't really work because that, that was an essay. <laughs> but let's say I go to a page like this and it's like boom, ah, okay, look. And then I say, ah, and then within like 10 seconds, just try to diagnose the problem. Identify the pattern, boom. Oh, this is a geometry question where a figure's not drawn. So I know the strategy is to draw the figure to scale and it's a triangle question, so I'm probably gonna be thinking about my common right triangles, for example. Do another roulette type thing, boom. Ah, this is quantitative comparisons. I have variables in both quantities, so I'm gonna make up numbers and test the fonts. Right? And I know I'm speaking a little bit of gibberish. Some of this stuff um, won't make complete sense to you just based on the videos you may have watched here. It makes sense, more sense to those of you uh, who may have um, maybe enrolled in my courses. But um, that's kind of what you want to do, right? And so don't worry about actually solving these questions at this point. I literally want you to just kind of leaf through and say, boom, yeah, okay, I know what to do. Boom, yeah, I know what to do. Boom, because that is kind of the diagnostics that you need to get good at on test day. That speeds up the process so that you don't have to spend as much time actually solving them because you've already kind of diagnosed it. And then ultimately, kind of the fourth component then is, what's the third component of our triad? Practice, practice. And I'm going to word that a little bit differently down here, test. Test yourself. At the end of the day, how do you get faster at doing anything? You do it more. You just do it more. So you need to test yourself in two different areas, right? The first area is in your practice itself, meaning just when you're working homework, uh, working homework problems. In the beginning, I said, don't worry about time. So like, don't worry about time. Time is not an issue, right? I don't care about how long it takes you. But eventually, now, yes, we do want to be working our homework problems with this goal in mind. Does that make sense? I had a, a coach one time, I was asking him, you know, how do I get faster? And he said something that just didn't make any sense to me at the time, but now makes a ton of sense to me. He said, Brett, the only way that you are going to get faster is by running faster. 
And I was like, oh, that, that is like, doesn't make any sense. Sound like Yogi Bear or something like that saying that. And he, he went on to explain it. He said, the problem is when you go out to run, you're wanting to get faster. But when you go out and run, you always kind of run the same speed. And so what you need to do is you need to force yourself to run faster. In other words, if you want to run a 5K, three miles, right? 3.1 miles. If you want to run a 5K faster, you can't just go out and jog at roughly the same pace all the time. You'll get in better shape and you might increase a little bit. What you need to do is go sprint certain sections and then kind of slow down and then sprint and then slow down to train your muscles to be able to go faster. Makes perfect sense to me now and he was exactly right. The same goes for you. Sometimes you, the reason you're not able to solve certain questions faster is because you're not trying to do them faster. And I know that may sound totally weird, but I assure you, if you literally set a stopwatch and give yourself that limited time and force yourself to come up with an answer within a certain amount of time, you will get better at solving questions faster. So that's what you absolutely need to do. Now, the second component of testing yourself is taking full-length practice tests. There is no substitute for solving 20 questions in 30 or 35 minutes under timed conditions when that clock is ticking away. And then, by the way, doing another section and another section, and then trying to do it when you're already mentally fried two and a half hours later. You know, how do you do that? Well, the only way to do that is to practice it, right? You wouldn't run, go out and try to run a marathon if you had never at least run a big percentage of a marathon, right? I know there's different training methodologies, but the point is you need to kind of practice for what you expect on test day. Now, I have a lot more to say about practice tests. By the way, you can grab uh, lots of full-length practice tests. I have up for uh, up to six for sale on my website. You see the URL here on your screen uh, where you can kind of find the practice tests on my website. You wanna take lots of practice tests. That's all I'm gonna say about it for now because actually this is a perfect segue then into question number two in our GRE goulash. Question number two from the mailbag, this one from John in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He says, you know, the first time I took the GRE, I was doing pretty well on my practice test, but didn't end up scoring as well on the real thing, on the real GRE. What do you think happened and how can I make sure it doesn't happen again? That's a great question, John, and I have got a couple of thoughts for you. The first is a little bit more technical in nature and the second is a little bit more philosophical. And actually, let me say this. Sometimes I actually get emails from students saying, hey, guess what? I actually did better on the real GRE even than in my practice test. So it's kind of the flip side of that coin. Obviously, you're concerned if you're not kind of performing up to standard. So what might be going on? You know, I love this quote by the great American football coach, Vince Lombardi, who says, you know, it's not just practice that makes perfect. That's often what we hear, isn't it? But rather it's perfect practice that makes perfect. So really what I want you to do is I want you to think about how you are practicing, not only on your practice tests, but just in general. You know, one of the things that a lot of students do is they'll shortchange their practice. You'll sit down and you'll start working on a question and as soon as you get stumped, what do you do? You kind of flip to the answer in the back or maybe the answer explanation if your book has a full answer explanation. And so you think you're learning, right? And so it's like, oh, I'm kind of stumped. Oh yeah, I see how they got that answer. And then now all of a sudden you think you know it. But that's absolutely not the case. I mean, think about vocabulary. If I asked you about a challenging word like aberrant, do you know what aberrant means? It's one of your GRE vocab words, by the way. And you kind of say, yeah, yeah, I know what aberrant means. And then I say, okay, define it for me. And you say, uh, 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 well, I mean, I, I, I know what it means. If I saw it and I was reading, I would know what it means. Yeah, but could you actually define it for me? right? And you really can't actually define it. And that's why when we're studying vocabulary, you want to make sure you can actually define the words yourself without any prompting. Same thing when you're practicing, right? Don't skip to the answer explanations too early because you don't have that luxury on the real GRE, right? You have to force yourself to come up with an answer at all costs. And how do you get good at doing that? by practicing doing that. So maybe you set your stopwatch and you force yourself to come up with an answer in the given amount of time, a minute and a half, a minute 45, uh, and before you flip to the answer choices, right? So that's just when you're practicing, what about your practice tests themselves? What conditions are you taking your practice tests under? And if perfect practice makes perfect, here's my recommendation to you. Treat your practice tests like the real thing. So what do I mean by that? 
if you're going to be taking the real GRE on a Saturday morning, when do you think you should be taking your practice tests? On a Saturday morning, not Saturday afternoon, right? A lot of times students feel like they need to squeeze in their practice test, almost like it's a burden. Oh, I've got to, I've got to figure out when I can, you know, allot three hours to take this practice test. You're preparing for the GRE. Your practice test is not a burden. It is important. And so you need to set aside the time and you need to do it at the time you're actually going to be taking it. If you're going to take it in the afternoon on a Wednesday, well, then you need to actually take your practice test in the afternoon on the Wednesday. Why? Well, because your blood sugar might be a little bit different in the afternoon versus the morning. Uh, maybe you have to go to the bathroom a little bit more in the morning. So you need to actually prepare for that and get used to that, right? Set yourself up under testing conditions. Lock the door, turn off your cell phone, don't get distracted. You know, the other thing some students do, believe it or not, they'll take their practice tests and they'll actually pause the test halfway through. Well, you're not gonna be able to do that on the real thing. Part of taking practice tests is preparing yourself mentally, including getting an idea of the mental stamina that it takes to do well, right? If you start fading at the end of the real GRE, you're gonna get a lot of those questions wrong. You need to build up the practice and, and kind of the mental fortitude, the mental endurance to be able to still be performing well a couple of hours into that test. And the only way you're gonna be able to do that is if you practice under testing conditions. So I think you get the idea, John, that may or may not be what's happening to you, but just understand not only how you're doing your practice questions in general, but certainly how you take your practice tests matters. And the second thing is more philosophical, and it has to do with overcoming test anxiety. Right? The other thing that may be happening is simply that you are over anxious, that you're overly nervous, that you're not performing up to par. You know, I call it being a gamer. Some people don't perform as well in sports on the you know, on game day, right? So like maybe you're a golfer and, and you can hit the ball wonderfully well on the driving range, but then when you actually go to a course, all of a sudden things start to fall apart. Conversely, some people, man, they show up and they're gamers. They always perform a little bit better under the pressure and the stress and the tension of the real thing because you have like heightened adrenaline and heightened uh, kind of awareness and, and you know it's the real thing. That's what you want to get to. And I had a coach tell me once, he said, you know, to win any game, to win any athletic endeavor, you always have to beat three things. You have to beat the opponent, you have to beat the referees, and you have to beat yourself. And that's the case on the GRE as well. We focus so much time and effort trying to beat the GRE, beat your opponent, right? But what about beating yourself. You need to overcome that anxiety. Now, there's actually a free bonus in my GRE course, a webinar I did with uh, kind of an anxiety expert about some tips and tricks you can use to overcome anxiety. But let me say this. In general, I think one of the best ways to do that, obviously you can do deep breathing. Um, I think preparation is a big aspect of overcoming anxiety. Think about why you're nervous. A lot of times you're nervous because you maybe don't feel totally prepared. I know when I play sports, if, I'm, if I've practiced, if I know I'm in shape, if I know my ground strokes, like if I'm playing tennis and my ground strokes are, are clicking on all cylinders, I'm not as nervous because I know I'm ready. And so I would make sure that you put in the adequate preparation to make sure you are ready for test day and then you'll be a little bit less nervous. Uh, but the other aspect is to have a little bit of perspective to have some perspective about where the GRE fits in time and space. You know, one of the things that I often do if I'm feeling overly stressed about something is to try to just remember where I fit in the grander scheme of things. I believe in God, you know, and I believe that he's ultimately in control. And sometimes I'll watch videos like this. Maybe you've actually seen a video like this, kind of a zoom out of the universe and you get a sense of, hey, you know, we're actually a fairly small piece in a much larger picture than when you, when you really think about it in the context of billions and billions of people on this planet. And this planet is one small aspect of certainly our solar system and universe. And, and things are much bigger. And so sometimes our problems seem a lot bigger than they really are. And, and it helps me to get that perspective and realize, you know, at the end of the day, what's the worst thing that happens if I don't perform up to my standards on, say, the GRE, right? And in fact, that's something I would encourage you to do. A lot of times I'll do a best case, worst case scenario when I'm stressed out about something. I'll literally write down what's the best case scenario if, if you know, in this situation, what's the absolute worst case scenario in this situation? And I'd encourage you to write that down as well. Like what's the absolute worst case scenario if you don't get the GRE score that you want in this moment? 
guess what guys, the sun's still gonna come up tomorrow, right? Life's gonna go on. Maybe it's my perspective having lived in Madagascar. I served in the Peace Corps and I lived in a thatched roof hut surrounded by people who make less than a dollar a day where I literally saw kids starving to death. They didn't have enough food, malnutrition was rampant. And all of a sudden, you know, the ability to take the GRE, to go to graduate school, I mean, think about the privilege, <clears throat> excuse me, the privilege that is. Really, I mean, you even just thinking about going to graduate school or business school, even just being able to have the opportunity to, to spend hundreds of dollars to take a test like the GRE and then potentially think about going to graduate school and business school, that sets you up in the top 5%, maybe even the top 1% of people in the world. And so I think if you have that shift of focus and understand it really is a privilege, you don't have to, it's not all about you, you don't have to get overly stressed out, like what's the worst thing that could happen and would you be okay with that? Like the worst thing that happens if you don't get the GRE score you want is, you know, take it again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe next time, sign up for my course. Take my course to make sure that you, you get the score you're looking for. Uh, maybe go to law school instead, right? There are options for you. But I'm confident you will get the GRE your score you're looking for if you can just control your anxiety, control your nerves, so that you absolutely perform your best on test day. So a little bit of technical, make sure you're practicing under te testing conditions, John. Uh, but then certainly philosophically, just kind of overcome that anxiety by putting things into perspective a little bit. So I hope that helps. Let's turn our attention to question number three from the mailbag. Question number three comes from Anusha Desai. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly from YouTube. She said, these strategies are awesome, referring to, I guess, the last video on our non-standard math strategies. And she says, but can you make a similar video for verbal? Thank you for that question, Anusha. And the answer is maybe I will, at some point in the future, make an entire video like the last one just devoted to verbal strategies. But since you asked, let's go ahead and talk about verbal a little bit. We have devoted a lot of time and attention in this video series so far to quantitative. And I think that's because most students struggle the most with quantitative. The other thing is the verbal section of the GRE is very vocabulary intensive. But that doesn't mean that all you need to do to do well on GRE Verbal is study a lot of vocabulary. That helps, right? Get your hands on you know, a list of vocab words in my course. I actually provide you with a list of the 400 most commonly tested GRE vocabulary words. Start studying, making flashcards, note cards of really every word that you come across in your everyday reading, for example, that you don't know because beefing up your vocabulary can help. But as I've talked about with respect to other aspects of the GRE, the GRE is a means to an end and your goal is still to get right answers. And on the verbal section, sometimes, you know, you may not know what certain words mean, either in the question stem, like the sentence or the answer choices. What do you do? You still need to give yourself a chance, at least, to potentially still get a right answer. And the good news is there are a lot of strategies for doing that. There are other strategies for reading comprehension, for example. So let me give you one of my best strategies, one of my favorite strategies when it comes to sentence completion questions. And if you remember, the kind of two types, text completions and then sentence equivalence questions. Here you see... <clears throat> excuse me, an example of a sentence equivalence question. We'll look at one here in more detail. And one of the strategies is, okay, what if, what if you don't know what some of the words mean in the answer choices? Like, what can you do? And there are a lot of strategies, like I said, but one of my favorites is to use the words charge. And here's what I mean by that, right? Sometimes you don't know exactly what a word means. Maybe in the actual question stem, like maybe you don't know what disposition means, for example, right? I could not understand his and we're supposed to fill in the blank attitude in the situation given his ordinarily cheerful disposition. And sometimes you're not going to know what the words in a couple of the words or several of the words in the answer choices mean. And maybe you do, maybe you don't. I'm just going to illustrate the point here, but you see a word like malevolent or amiable. Uh, but we can still get at the right answer in some cases using the words charge. And here's what I mean by that, right? If you think about like a kind of a, a chronology or timeline or whatever from negative to positive, <clears throat> is the word, even if you can't define it, is the word a negative word or a positive word? Does it mean like good things, like good or bad, right? Positive or 
negative. And sometimes that alone, having a sense of that is enough to certainly eliminate some wrong answer choices and maybe to zero in on the actual correct answer. So let's just end, let me just kind of illustrate it and then we'll look at this, right? I could not understand his blank disposition given, so we have some road signs here and I teach these certainly in a little bit more detail, but given his, so I could not, we have kind of like an alternate, an opposing road sign, something that sets up a kind of a, an opposite um, situation in the sentence, right? In other words, he ordinarily is cheerful. That's a key word. And because he's usually that way, I could not understand that he was this way, right? So we would expect this word to be what? The opposite of cheerful, given those road signs and key words in the sentence. And so we know that this blank to complete this sentence logically must be a negatively charged word, some sort of a, a bad word, some sort of a bad, he had a bad attitude, some sort of negative attitude. Because ordinarily, right, key word, he was cheerful, right? So very easy, very obvious. And so sometimes we can look at the answer choices and say, hey, you know, malevolent. Oh, I can't define it. I don't really know what that means. Ah, but kind of this word mal, like if somebody put a gun to my head, I'd say, yeah, that's kind of a negatively charged word. Probably sounds like it means something bad uh, versus amiable. That's very positively charged, even if you can't actually define it. And same thing here, like I haven't given you the rest of the answer choices, but maybe answer choice D is negatively charged. Maybe E is just neutral, so we don't do anything with that. Maybe answer choice B is kind of positively charged. So we can get rid of some wrong answer choices just by knowing that. Does it make sense? And so now maybe malevolent is in the running. Now, of course, uh, with sentence equivalence, the other answer choice would have to be, if not a perfect synonym, at least lead to completing the sentence to mean the same thing. So that's kind of how sentence equivalence works. Uh, equivalent questions work if you haven't studied those. Let me give you a further illustration of exactly what I'm talking about. I'm actually going to play you a clip right now of the answer explanation to one of the questions on my sentence equivalence worksheet that comes with my verbal course. Uh, kind of I have actually an a la carte course as well just for sentence completion or sentence equivalence. Obviously it's in my full course, but I'm going to show you the, the question itself, give you a chance to try it on your own, and then actually walk you step by step through exactly what I'm talking about, illustrate this idea of positive and negative charge in a little bit more detail, and I think it'll just benefit in general from kind of and teaching that I do in this video around how to think through sentence equivalence questions. So you ask for some, some help with verbal, a little bit of verbal strategy. Take a look at this question, press pause, give it a try yourself, and then I'll come back and you'll hear me talking you through it uh, as I do in my actual course. Question number 13. Question number 13 is challenging for two reasons. One is that the key word in the main sentence is a word that you may not know. And if you don't know what the word glib means, this question is going to be difficult, right? Because how is Byron described? He is generally thought as, frequently thought of as glib. So if you don't know what glib means, it could be difficult, although we can still get a right answer. The second thing is the road sign, though, can lead to an eye-catcher wrong answer, though usually introduces an opposition of thought, right? Even though Byron is thought of as glib, we would then assume maybe even though such and such, well, therefore, you know, the opposite of that. So maybe we would think that the underlined word or the blank word should be something that's the opposite of glib, but that's actually not the case. Because if we read it, even though he is frequently thought of as glib, it is still hard, so it is still, continues the road sign, hard to dismiss another keyword, him as such and such, a such and such thinker. That actually introduces parallel thought. It continues the thought, right? Because the word dismiss, it's like a negative of a negative in math, right? Though is an opposition of thought, but then it says we can't dismiss another negative, so it's like a double negative. So now it leads to a situation like two negatives make a positive where we actually want a word that is essentially a synonym of glib. Does that make sense? 
And so that's the flow of this sentence. But if you still don't know what glib means, how do we figure out what a synonym of glib means? Well, this is where we can pull from another one of our strategies, which is to think about the words charge. Do you think you would dismiss somebody as being positive or negative? A positive or negatively charged word. In other words, if it's hard, okay, even though he's this way, right? Even though he's this way, right? Even though it's probably going to be something negative, right? We're trying to apologize for it or explain it away. Even though he's kind of this way, it's still, yeah, we still can't really dismiss him as. Dismiss him introduces a very negative connotation. That's, that's something you would do like you're just, oh, just, well, we can't, we can't totally discount him yet. We can't dismiss him as a negative type of a thinker. Does that make sense? So using the words charge, even if we don't know what glib means, we still know we're going to be looking for a negatively charged word. So now as we look through the answer choices, well, profound is like the opposite of that, right? If he's a profound thinker, that's a good thing. That means he's very deep, right? Very insightful. Same thing with lucid. If you're a lucid thinker, that means you're smart, you're sharp, you're clear. So those would be positively charged words, and we would eliminate them because we know, even if we don't know what the word glib means, that we're looking for a negatively charged word. Uncompromising, yeah, that could be potentially seen as negative. Verbose is just kind of neutral. Verbose means you're wordy. Um, and then superficial and lightweight. Lightweight would be negatively charged. Superficial uh, just means you can't, you can't go deep. It's like the opposite of profound. That would be a negatively charged word. So we essentially have three possibilities, superficial, lightweight, uncompromising. Um, which two of those words go together? Well, obviously, superficial and lightweight would lead to the same meaning of the sentence. And even if we're not sure what superficial means, which we should, even if we don't know what glib means, superficial and lightweight are synonyms enough that they would lead to um, the same meaning, which is what we're going for in these types of, of questions, uh, as opposed to uncompromising. An uncompromising thinker, yeah, it's negative, but it doesn't, it doesn't go with glib, so we'll talk about what glib means here in a second, but it also doesn't have another word that matches it. Verbose just means you're wordy. Verbose is a good eye catcher because... Um, Glib is usually referring to speech, right? If you're glib, it has to do with how you talk. And if you knew that, or at least if you couldn't define it in the back of your mind, you knew it had to do with uh, how, how you talk, how you speak, sometimes it can have to do with actions. Uh, but verbose would be an eye catcher because, hey, verbose has to do with speaking. It means you're wordy, right? But that would be the eye catcher wrong answer. So the correct answer is, our answer choices A and C. By the way, glib does mean you know you're fluent, you talk a lot, you're excessively talky, you're smooth talking, but actually with a negative connotation, right? As indicated by the words though and dismissing and so forth. So you're talkative, but usually it's thoughtlessly, it's it's sort of superficially. And in fact, that's why A superficial is essentially a synonym of glib, which we know we're looking for. And then lightweight is the same type thing. In other words, you don't go deep, you stay surface level. But we can't dismiss him that way, even though he is frequently thought of as glib. So there's a way of thinking about still getting a right answer, even if you're stumped by what some of the words mean, using the words charge, but also then using road signs and keywords elsewhere in the sentence to still get a pretty good understanding of what the, the word that must fill the blank uh, should be answer choices A and C. So what do you think? Hopefully you found that pretty helpful. Whether you knew all the vocab words or not, I think there's some really good strategies in there for you to help you with verbal. Now, with that, let's turn our attention to question number four in uh, this GRE goulash. Question number four from the mailbag comes from Samantha in Vancouver who asks, you know, you've talked mostly about the quantum verbal sections of the GRE so far in these videos. How important are the essays? Good question, Samantha. And the short answer to your question is not really, right? They're not nearly as important, your essays, as your main verbal and quantitative scores, that 130 to 170 point quant and verbal scores. That's the main score. Those are the main scores that the admissions officers are looking at. You know, I've talked to lots of admissions directors from a lot of the top universities around the world, and they admit as much. And they basically say that as long as your essay score is not kind of out of whack, you know, A, with the rest of your GRE, but B, as long as there's not a huge 
huge kind of dichotomy between your GRE essay score and, say, your admissions essays, then you're okay. If you remember your essays, uh, you get one score for both essays kind of collectively aggregate between a zero and a six, right? And so let's say you do really, really poorly, right? So let's say you get like a one or a two or even a three on your essays on the GRE, but you submit this application to business school, graduate school, whatever, and you've got these stellar essays. I mean, essays that just wow the admissions officers. They're well, well thought out. They're articulate. There are no grammar errors. I mean, they're just spectacular essays. And then they look at that and say, but wait a second. How did this person then get a one on the essays on the GRE or a two on the essays on the GRE? Either they didn't try on the GRE, which I would never advise you just kind of like throw in the towel on the essays, right? So either you didn't try or maybe did you actually get somebody to write your admissions essays for you? You see how that could throw up some red flags? Like how in the world did they do so poorly on these essays, but then on the flip side have such amazing application essays, maybe the person cheated somehow, right, in their application process. So as long as you do just pretty well, you should be good to go. Now, how do you do pretty well, at least, or if not excellently, on, on the GRE essays? Um, it's kind of beyond the scope of what I want to cover here, but I do want to give you some nuggets. I want to give you some gold, right? I want to be very practical in these videos for you. The reality is there are two essays that you're going to write, right? The issue essay and the argument essay. So you have an issue analysis of, uh, sorry, uh, issue essay or an argument essay and you have 30 minutes within which to write each and generally students do a lot better on not that they do a lot better but they find the issue essay a lot easier why because you just kind of weigh in on an issue it's like essays that have you written in the that you've written in the past the harder essay tends to be the argument essay and because what you're asked to do is something that you maybe haven't done a lot of before or don't know how to do and that is analyze a logical argument Right? And so what I want to do is I want to give you the number one biggest take-home message, the number one best strategy that you need to learn and kind of internalize when you're thinking about writing the argument essay. And that is this. Listen to me. Write notes. Pay attention. Right here. Leave your opinions at the door. If you do that on the argument essay, that's the best thing you can do. The number one mistake most students make on the argument essay is that they treat it like the issue essay, where you are supposed to basically give your opinion and then back it up, right? You state a thesis and you back it up with supporting examples. That's not what you're doing on the argument essay. On the argument essay, you are analyzing the argument. You are objectively, kind of scientifically, picking it apart, dissecting it. Where does the argument fall apart? Where are the faulty assumptions? Like, how could the author strengthen the argument? Leave your opinion at the door. Instead, analyze the argument, right? So I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here, but I still want to, if you've never thought about analyzing the argument and you're not sure what I'm talking about or even what to do on this essay, let me teach it to you really quickly. It all starts by looking and reading the argument and kind of breaking it out into its component parts. Because if you don't know what the component parts are, how are you going to analyze it? And there are three parts of any logical argument. The underlying premises, and the conclusion, which is the author's main point, and then the assumptions that the author is making. And I'm going to talk about these here in a second because this is really the crux of the entire thing and what you are trying to do, right? But all arguments have some sort of conclusion, like the main reason I am like I'm writing this thing, the main thing I'm trying to get across, right? So for example, let's say I came up to you on the street and I said, hey, guess what? Roscoe has a tail. Roscoe has a tail. That's like my conclusion. I am, I'm concluding that Roscoe has a tail. I'm telling you that. Now, what's your logical response to that? Like, what would you maybe ask? You might say, how do you know that? Right? So, you know you've found the conclusion when your question, your logical question would be really, hmm, how did you know that? Well, I'm concluding that Roscoe has... 
it's possible that 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 could also be a premise, right? I mean, I could just objectively know that Roscoe has a tail, but let's assume that I don't know anything about, like I don't know, I've never seen Roscoe. Does that make sense? I've never seen Roscoe and I said, huh, Roscoe must have a tail. Roscoe has a tail and you're like, well, why are you concluding that? How do you know that? Ah, premise, premise are the facts, the reasons, kind of the objective, uh, like underlying proof, if you will, that an author uses to tie the conclusion, to draw the conclusion, right? They're the facts that the conclusion rests on. So the premise is just some sort of an objective fact, like all dogs have tails, right? So two parts of an argument. You have the premises, and those are always stated. In fact, when you're reading the essay prompt, most of what you're reading is going to be premises. But then somewhere in there, maybe the last sentence, maybe the first sentence, it's not always clear. You have to kind of root it out and figure out what's the author's main point is the conclusion. So Roscoe has a tail. Hmm. I'm drawing that conclusion based on the fact, the premise, that all dogs have tails. Does that make sense? So if this were your argument and you were trying to write an essay about that, how would you, how would you analyze it? How would you question it? How would you weaken it? How would you, uh, how should the author, what, what should the author provide to strengthen it? And it all rests on your ability to identify the author's underlying assumption. And the assumption is never stated. It's not going to be there. You see the text, the assumption's not there by definition. It's something that is being assumed. It's the, it's the logical connection that enables you to draw this conclusion you know, from this premise. And obviously here, what must I be assuming? I'm told that all dogs have tails, and I say, oh, okay, then Roscoe has a tail, right? What must I be assuming? That Roscoe, Roscoe is a dog. Clearly, I'm assuming that, right? So how do you spend your time in the essay? You spend your time in the essay talking about that assumption. By the way, crucial point, crucial take-home message. To weaken an argument, you do not attack the premise. Like, I wouldn't spend time saying, well, you know, the truth is there are some dogs that are born without tails, you know? Yeah, maybe, but really, that's not what I'm trying to do to weaken the argument. If I am told that all dogs have tails, that's like gospel truth, right? We take the premises as truth. I don't weaken an argument by attacking the premise. I do so by attacking the assumption. And that's how you want to spend most of your essay, right? So I would want to say, well, um, the truth of the matter is, how do we know that Roscoe is a dog, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, it's obviously a very easy kind of superficial example to teach you the premise, conclusion, the assumption, the parts of an argument, and to give you the big picture mindset of what you are trying to accomplish. Again, biggest take home message is leave your opinions at the door. Instead, you actually want to dissect the argument, break it out into its component parts, and spend most of your time focused on identifying the author's underlying assumptions and then attacking or kind of exposing them and then talking about how the author could beef up the argument um, as, per, as per the instruction. You have to read the directions. The directions are generally the same, analyze the argument, but sometimes the, the direction prompt will ask you to, to identify different things or talk about different aspects of the argument. So you know, definitely pay attention to the directions themselves, but in general, this is what you are trying to do. So hope that helps. And finally, you know, this has been a long video. Thanks for sticking with us. Hopefully you found it very empowering, very helpful. We have one question left from the mailbag, so let's take a, que uh, a look at questions. Question number five. Question number five from the mailbag comes from Sheen via Facebook. And Sheen says, I'm busy working two jobs and only have a small time to study. Where should I focus my time? That is a great question. It's one that I get asked all the time. My guess is it's a question that you have as well. Um, because we have, we have obligations, right? We want to continue to live life. We can't always make the GRE our number one priority, like make it a full-time job. Oftentimes we do already have another job or two jobs in the case of Sheen. We have kids. We have other hobbies and, and activities. And so how do, you, how do you juggle both? Where should you focus your time and attention and your efforts? And I want to address that briefly. Let me 
actually kind of jump to the end and give you kind of a sneak peek. The truth of the matter is I'm going to attack this question in a little bit more detail in the next video. I have a solution for you, a comprehensive solution for you, a way to kind of get the biggest bang for your buck. And so check your inbox for details about that. Certainly watch the next video. I encourage you to partner with me in that. You know, it involves going a little bit deeper than we've gone in this video series. So I think you're going to be excited about that. I look forward to bringing you uh, that opportunity and that product for you. Uh, but here, let me talk just kind of generally. Unfortunately, we can't shortchange the process. There's no such thing as a magic pill you can take, no such thing as a quick fix for the GRE. At the end of the day, if you remember our triad, our triad of success, there are three components of doing well on the GRE, and you can't really compromise any of those three if you expect to get the great results that you're looking for. You've got to put some content in your mind. We have to learn some strategies. You're going to have to practice it. But you can get a bigger return for your time investment if you focus in certain key areas. You may have heard of the Pareto Principle. It's certainly taught throughout business school, graduate school. And the Pareto Principle that says that 20% of your efforts, right, 20% of your efforts in anything, uh, business generally, uh, but also things like the GRE, lead to 80% of your results. You know, if you're in sales, uh, you know, it's a handful of your customers that tend to produce most of your revenue. And a lot of times we chase the extra, you know, we chase those extra 20%. The problem is we chase that extra 20% at the expense of like the headaches that come with the sometimes the harder things or maybe the clients that are a little bit more of a headache. So in the GRE, we want to focus on kind of that 20% effort that's going to yield the biggest result. Right. So if you want to dive deeper and really focus on all of those areas, kind of expand from that 20% to really everything uh, that you need to know for the GRE, especially if you're wanting to get the really high scores and dive even deeper, I am going to give you that opportunity. Would love to partner with you and dive even deeper and kind of give you that comprehensive look with a focus on getting right answers. Obviously, strategy, everything that I, I've talked about in this video series will be covered. So, you know, again, just be on the lookout for that. Check your inbox. I look forward to diving deeper with you. But for now, and this has been a long video, thanks for sticking all the way through it. Maybe you kind of skipped ahead to the end of this video because you already kind of knew some of the questions that we were going through. But hopefully it's been empowering for you. Hopefully this whole series so far has been empowering for you. What I'd love to know from you, just kind of as we wrap up this video in the comments area below is simply answer this question. What was your biggest aha moment from this video? What was the biggest take-home message? What's something that you had never thought about before? Something you maybe have never seen before as you've been studying for the GRE? Maybe a shift in your perspective, right? Maybe our, our conversation about uh, kind of the philosophy of the GRE and having some perspective so that you perform your test on Deste. Whatever it was, what was your biggest aha moment? I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions at this point, questions about things I talked about in this video, or even still just big picture questions about the GRE, post them as well. I will personally look at them, answer them, and look forward to continuing to work with you and partner with you and empower you to dominate the GRE.